For those of you who might not know, uh, our daughter is uh, due uh, to deliver any day now and could happen any minute. That's why I brought my phone up here with me. So if I get a text, I'm running out and Jonathan is running in. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how that goes. So today's uh, story is uh, really one of the more unusual stories in Scripture. And uh, reading it makes people, honestly, uh, fairly uncomfortable. And there's reasons for that that are reasonable. But there's also truth in this that it's really valuable for us to examine. And especially if you've ever been through a series of disappointments or failures in your life so that you don't know if you can ever get back to the place where you can fully enjoy or celebrate things again. And uh, this story probably speaks more powerfully to that than almost any other story we can find in Scripture. And so this morning we're in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. David has now become the king of Israel, and it says, uh, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all the men went up to Bela in Judah to bring up from there the ark of the Lord, or the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who's enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was, one, uh, uh, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart. Now, how many would like to know the secret to pronouncing biblical names? <laughs> okay, you ready? You just do the best you can. That's the secret, so... <laughs> Uh, with the Ark of God on it, and Ohio, Ohio, not Ohio, Ohio is a state, <laughs> was walking in front of it. And David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God because the oxen stumbled and the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of this irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. See, that's, that's the challenge, isn't it? We read something like, like that, and we just go, that is a huge overreaction. <laughs> and, uh, you know, why, why couldn't God just tase him? <laughs> this, this last week, I was in a, a meeting where two chairs away from me was a former president of a West African nation. And so there was lots of security in the room. And when I reached into my backpack to pull out my iPad, I noticed they became rather alert. <laughs> and so I did what I needed to do, and then I put it back in. But I so enjoyed the experience that I, I took it out again. <laughs> a couple more times, and then I reached into my pocket to pull out my phone, and uh, I, I didn't want it to be a boring experience for them. I wondered how far I could go before they would tase me. And, uh, and David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez, which means breakout against Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now, King David was told the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf, Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets, and as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she, what's the next word? She despised him in her heart. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, 
how the king of Israel distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people of Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Such a strange story, and it troubles us. Because it seems as though God significantly overreacts. And in one instant, a parade is transformed to a funeral procession. So what's happening? Well, the Ark of the Covenant is being transported. And the Ark of the Covenant was a box that was made of wood. It was a little less than four feet long. It was two feet deep and two feet wide. And it was plated with gold. It had a lid that was solid gold. And on that lid, there was the image of two cherubim. These are not the chubby little baby angels that you see on Valentine's Day cards. Uh, these are warlike creatures that are part of God's angelic army. And they are facing each other. And inside of the ark, there were three articles that were significant. The first were the stone tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai that he had carved God's laws into. And the second was a jar that contained manna. You may recall that when Israel escaped from Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness for decades until they were able to take possession of the promised land, all the time they were in the wilderness, God supernaturally supplied for their nourishment by this thing called manna. In case you're wondering what manna means, it literally means, what is it? They, they'd never seen anything like it. They'd never tasted anything like it. When they ate it, it sustained them and it nourished them. But every morning they would get up and there was more of it on the ground. They would collect it, they would eat it, and, and God provided for them that entire time that they uh, journeyed in the wilderness. And then there was one more thing. There was Aaron's rod. And uh, we all know the, the stories from Moses' rod. Moses' rod is a, a, a pronounced thing that you notice in the Old Testament. If you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, obviously very noticeable in that movie. But Aaron's rod also has a number of stories associated with it, and I won't go into all of them, but probably the last one is one of the most significant. Uh, there was kind of a rebellion among the leadership within the nation of Israel, and they got frustrated that Moses and Aaron were considered the leaders. Uh, Moses was the leader, Aaron was considered the priest. And they said, well, who elected you to be in charge over all of us? And we think there should be new leadership. And so Moses said, well, let's, let's just take all of our staffs and let's put it into the tent of meeting overnight and let's see if God makes a selection. And the next morning when they went into the tent of meeting, Aaron's rod had actually flowered on the end of it and produced almonds. The staff that he walked around with, there's no way that could have produced any life, and yet it did. And by that action, that indicated to all the people that Aaron was God's choice to be the priest. So what are these three things? Well, the tablets of stone uh, indicate God's laws. The jar indicated God's provision. And Aaron's rod indicated God's ability to bring life in lifeless situations and God's right to choose. Now, the Ark didn't actually have any magical properties. If you've watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, which is an old enough movie, I don't think I have to worry about giving a spoiler alert. But at the end of that movie, the German soldiers are going to look into the Ark, and this rather magical, powerful thing occurs in which they are reduced to nothing but skeletons. And Indiana Jones and his, his uh, romantic interests are saved simply because they don't look. It's as though this, this artifact has some supernatural power. One of the challenges in the nation of Israel is that people would often begin to consider the ark of God as a source of power or as a good luck charm. And whenever they treated it that way, God would send prophets to correct that because God never wanted to be represented by artifacts. God always wanted to interact with people personally and relationally and in the form of covenant, which is like a, a promise on steroids. And so God's insistence is that he wasn't going to be represented or presented by icons and by uh, uh, things that, that had been created to represent him. He insisted on representing himself. So 
The Ark of the Covenant is really more a constant reminder of those three things, God's laws, God's provision, God's right to choose. Much as communion would be a reminder to us of the price that God paid for our salvation and the grace that he has made available to us. Now, the ark had been stored for a number of years in the house of a priest whose name was Abinadab. And uh, he had two sons, uh, Uzzah and Ahio. And uh, uh, David had decided that what he would like to do is move the ark from where it had been stored for over 30 years to the city of Jerusalem, which he has just named as his capital. And uh, what he wants to do is he wants people to have a focus on the rule of God, not just his government. And so he wants people to remember that our, our worship of God, our connection to God is a significant thing. So he's going to, to transport this. He, he gets 30,000 young and able men to be part of this incredible procession. And uh, he has a new cart constructed, uh, and, and they, they put the ark on the back of it. And uh, uh, Ahio is, is leading it in the front, and Uzzah is in the back. And as they're going along, uh, one of the oxen stumble. And when the oxen stumbles, uh, the ark begins to slide. And in order to keep it from falling off into the, onto the ground, Uzzah reaches out and grabs hold of it. And in that moment, the parade turned into a funeral procession. Instantly, he died. And uh, David has a very powerful emotion in that moment, and his emotion is anger followed by another powerful emotion, which is fear. These are probably the two strongest emotions and most common emotions we feel. Now, honestly, when you look at a passage like this, it raises a lot more questions than it answers. There's, there's, it feels like there's missing information. There's something we should know more about. And people have used this passage uh, and interpreted it in a way to indicate that what this actually teaches us is God doesn't like it when you bring something new to worship, that, that they were transporting the ark on a new cart and they should have used the tried and true ways, and if they didn't do that, God didn't like it and he was going to punish you. And so there's whole systems of religious tradition that, that will call any element of creativity a new cart. And we all know what happens when you try to do something on a new cart. There's going to be some uzzah that goes down somewhere. And that's simply not what this passage is teaching. In fact, if anything, the Bible talks about the necessity of creative elements within our worship experience. It would say things like this, that we should sing to the Lord a new song. It doesn't mean that there's never songs that we repeat, but that there's this ongoing journey in faith that we take together and give expression to. And, uh, of course, even the room that we're gathered in would look very different from rooms that uh, believers would have gathered in 500, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. And uh, even believers or followers of, of uh, God before the birth of Christ. You know, our, our worship environments have changed, but we shouldn't refer to those as new carts. That, that's really not the point. So if we're going to derive some helpful information out of this, uh, how should we think about it? And I think this passage helps us understand what it's like and what steps are necessary to be able to move from seasons when we've been disappointed and failed and, and we feel like we've, we've lost something of our capacity for joy and it's never going to happen for us again to a place that, like David, he, he, go, he does the dance, like it's the dance. And it's so joyous that, that nobody can watch it and ignore it. And so how do we do that? Well... Um, th this is the first point, and it is, it is unwise to try to take charge of God. It's unwise to try to take charge of God. Uh, Uzzah considered mud and dust and dirt something that the ark of God or that God needed to be protected from. The ark must not touch the ground. This is really intriguing because... If you've even gotten in the first two chapters of Genesis, uh, then you know that actually human beings were created by God from the dust of the earth. That, that's, that's what, that was the raw material God used to create us. And so what is, what is Uzzah doing here? Well, what Uzzah is saying is that God needs to be protected from some dust and maybe not other dust, that 
that dust that represents the, the sons of priests, they should have full access to the holy things of God, while other dust should not. Um, other dust should keep its distance. Now, here's what's interesting is, is we've all made decisions in our life that violated the values and the commands of God, sometimes accidental, sometimes intentional, but we've all done it. Uh, the ground has never done anything in violation of God. And yet, uh, Uzzah felt like he needed to protect God from that. So he felt like he was in charge of God. Here's something you should know. You can't put God into a box. You can't keep God in a box. And, and in fact, it doesn't matter what the box is made of, whether it's wood or hewn of stone, or if it's a box of, of ideas or feelings. There are people who constantly keep trying to categorize and limit the reality of God, and we can't do that. We are not in charge of God. God is in charge of us. So this is what tends to happen with lots of people in their spiritual journey. They, they begin their spiritual journey, they're exposed to grace, and they're exposed to truth, and, and this is an exciting and enlightening experience for them. And uh, they learn some healthy ways to navigate life. And, and they learn how to communicate with God in prayer. And, and they learn how to connect with a community of, of people who are, are also seeking God. They, they learn how to engage in worship. And, and they, they learn how to experience God for themselves. And, and we actually start rearranging our routines so that we're connected with things that bring meaning and hope to our lives. This is how our journey kind of develops and proceeds. But over time, there is a risk of something else beginning to happen. And while we start out being excited about this experience and we invite other people to check it out for themselves, over time we do less inviting and we do more telling people how they should and shouldn't live. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to manage God. And people who don't measure up, then maybe they shouldn't get access. And religious environments can become very concerned about their reputations and who gets let into the room. In case you don't know it, we're not concerned about our reputation and who we let into the room. We'll let anybody in here. Because we think that grace is more contagious than anything else in the world. And it actually transforms our lives. So people start taking charge of God. And we begin to determine what dust needs to keep their distance from God. And we can become a little bit controlling and a little bit judgmental. And this is what it means to take charge of God. And, and once here's the thing. Once you start down this road and you attempt to manage God, something begins to happen to your faith and your sense of awe and your sense of hope and your sense of joy. They all begin to be eroded a little bit until eventually you get to the place where it feels like death to you. If it's not addressed, all that's left in your life is anger towards others. Jesus actually talked a lot about this. He would say things like this. He would say that people who are caught up in this cycle and they've gotten to this point, point he says, they're like whitewashed tombs that are full of dead people's bones. It's not a good thing. So when you look at it this way, Uzzah's death actually wasn't sudden. It took years for him to die. It just culminated in that moment. Now, David was a very different kind of guy. He never thought that he was in charge of God or that God was to be managed. In fact, his life had a lot of risk associated with it. As a shepherd, he'd had lions and bears who attacked the flock, and God had protected him and given him victory in those moments. He faced a taunting giant, which everyone else was terrified by, and once again, God had protected him and given him victory in that moment. He, he, his own king attempted personally to assassinate him, and when that didn't work, marshaled military forces to hunt him down like an animal, and over and over again, God would protect him. And God would spare his life. So David knew, I'm not in charge of God. God's in charge of me. He keeps helping me and providing for me and protecting me. And so his, his actions and attitude towards God is very different from that of Uzzah's. But it does say when this occurred, it says he was very angry with God. So I have a question. Think about this. Why didn't God strike 
David down for his anger. He clearly struck Uzzah down for touching the ark. And here's the thing. If you'd have asked Uzzah if he'd ever been angry with God, he probably would have denied it. He would have considered it out of bounds. But David knows something that Uzzah doesn't. I see people in their spiritual journeys come to conclusions where they go through a season in their life and something happens that they don't like. It's, it's painful. It's disappointing. It's heartbreaking. And, and they'll become angry with God. And they may even talk to God and, and use some angry expressions toward God, toward God. And then they'll come to me and they'll say, I think I've lost my faith. I said, well, how is that? And they said, well, I'm just angry at God. And I said some things to him I probably shouldn't have said. And I said, so who were you talking to? He said, well, I was talking to God. I'm really ticked off at him right now. And I said, so you're talking to someone that you still believe is real. How is that a loss of faith? It's not a loss of faith. We need to think these things through. And so David hasn't, he's not at a place where he doubts the existence of God. He's just frustrated because what God is doing, he doesn't understand. And so he was angry. Now, the second point is this. It's wise to notice evidence of God's blessing. If you want to move from, from being joyless due to failure and mistakes and disappointments to a place where you can dance again, then one of the things you're going to have to do is start paying attention to the blessings of God in your life. Now, what had happened is the ark had been stored in another house for three months. And during that three months, the Bible says that that entire household was blessed. Now, we don't know what that means. Uh, we don't know what they're referring to. Maybe their crops were particularly abundant. Or, or maybe someone was, who was sick in the house was getting better. Or maybe they had some business proposition that worked out really well. Or maybe just their, their flocks and their herds were increasing exponentially. We don't know what it meant, but we know whatever it was, everybody says, God is blessing that entire household. Uh, I wonder if we are aware of God's blessing in our lives. All of us wish we had more, but are we grateful that we have enough? We have friends. We have health, we have time, we have strength, we have abilities, we have opportunities, we have favor with people. Uh, even a great tasting meal is something you can be grateful for, isn't it? I mean, I can tell you what the five best tasting meals I've ever had in my life were, and I can tell you where I was when I ate them. I've also been at some meals where I knew to give thanks before I ate it was an act of faith. <laughs> because it was highly likely no Thanksgiving was coming on the tail end of this meal. That happens. Something that brings a smile to your face. A simple sense of hope. Do you have any idea how many people live every single day and don't even have a split? second of hope in it. It is so easy to focus on the things that make us angry and that make us afraid that we lose sight of the evidence of God's blessings in our lives. And if you want to move from this lifeless existence because of disappointment to a place where you're fully engaged in joy and able to celebrate, it won't happen unless you take some time to start paying attention to the blessings of God in your life. My last point is this, is that worship is preoccupation with God, not with ourselves. It's preoccupation with God. David is overjoyed to have another opportunity to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And so in the 90 days that has occurred since his first attempt, he's actually done a little research. He's looked into the law of God, and he's discovered that God insists that whatever represents him should be presented by people, that God, God is not in the artifact business. And so what he discovered is, is that God's um, guidelines for this is that when the ark was to be moved, that there would be priests who would take these rods and they would put it through a series of rings that were attached to the ark of the covenant, and then they would place these rods on their shoulders and they would walk with it. And so after they'd gone six paces, 
then David had a sacrifice that he offered to the Lord and then began this incredible, joyous procession all the way to Jerusalem, which, by the way, was not just a couple of blocks. It was a significant um, procession. And what it tells us is, is that uh, David danced before the Lord. He danced before the Lord. And I won't ask you how many in this room think that you are good dancers, but some of you do. I've seen some of you at wedding receptions, and you are good dancers. I'm impressed by people who can do that. Like, uh, my wife and I took some dance lessons, so we can do like a waltz or a foxtrot or something like that. But to get out there all by yourself and just shake whatever it is you shake uh, is, this is a terrifying concept to me. <laughs> I mean, th this would be a form of unusual punishment. Like, it should be outlawed by the Geneva Convention. This should never happen. And, and in fact, he actually dressed. David dressed for this occasion. He's not wearing his kingly robes. He's got a linen ephod. He knows that he can't bust the moves he's going to do if he's wearing these restricted garments in the kingly robes. And he's not, this is what's interesting, he's not trying to use God to make himself look more important. That's a really big deal. Have you ever seen those videos where Someone who's been serving in the military surprises their spouse or their kids by showing up in a location that they didn't know they were going to be there. You can find them on YouTube. I'll warn you, they'll, they'll bring tears to your eyes. Of course, everything will bring tears to my eyes. I cry at commercials, but, you know, the, and, and you'll see, and all of a sudden, the person that they love and they think is half a world away is suddenly in the airport or in the stadium or in the arena or in the mall or in the, in the school, wherever they showed up. And, and when that person recognizes who it is, they always do the same thing. They run like crazy for that person. And they leap into the air and they wrap their arms around them and the tears stream down their cheeks, and they often bury their face on their shoulder because they are so glad their, their spouse or their parent is home. And in that moment, they don't know anybody else is watching. They're just so happy that this person is there. Nothing else matters. And that's what it was like for David. His, he was so God conscious, that he stopped being self conscious. And uh, so David's doing this dance, and it's quite the dance. And uh, uh, his wife, uh, McCall, did not like this dance one bit. Uh, a little bit of history about her she's not just David's wife, she also happens to be the daughter of the previous king, King Saul. And so when uh, if there was anybody who was preoccupied with impression management, it was King Saul. How he looked mattered most above all things. And so there are ways that you can walk. There are things that you can wear. There are ways you enter a room and how you treat people that give you the advantage and, and give you control and demonstrate strength. And, and there's some things that you don't ever do because you don't want anybody to think that you are less or you are weak or that you are humble. And David is just breaking every single rule, and it's driving McCall absolutely nuts. And so she knew how kings were supposed to act, and this was not the way that he was acting. And uh, so Scripture says that she despised David for how he looked. And uh, she uses shame-based language when she talks to him. Shame language is so powerful. It's a horrible weapon, and we should not use it. God never intended shame to be a tool of the church. Shame is what happens when we walk in paths that we should not walk, but it's grace that calls us back, not shame. And so she just engages in this language. Her goal is to embarrass David because she was embarrassed by him. She was embarrassed for him. And this is when we find out David is really an unusual person because it doesn't work on him. Shame is so powerful, it works on almost all of us, almost any time it's used. And it doesn't work on David. And his response sounds like he's taking a shot at her. He says, it was before the Lord 
who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people of Israel. And uh, here's the thing about reading scripture. We often add tone to it that isn't there. And he's not taking a shot. This is what he's saying. I know I was not selected to be king because I was self-conscious. I was selected to be king because I was God-conscious. Now, remember those three items in the ark? The law of God? David had researched the proper way to present God in our world. And the provision of God. David had noticed how that the household that had stored the ark for 90 days was blessed. And then the, the rod that demonstrated the selection power of God. He knows he's been selected by God and the only thing left to do is rejoice and dance. Now, I really wanted to leave the last portion out. In fact, I didn't put this last verse in your notes. Because of all days, this is the worst day to read this verse. And it says that McCall did not have any children all the days of her life. And what do we do? We read into that, that God inhibited her capacity to produce life because she said something she shouldn't have said to David. And here's what I want you to know. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible said when God was angry with Uzzah, the Bible said that God struck him. The Bible didn't say God did anything to McCall. We should not read something into that. What the Bible did say is that she despised him. So how do you think that marriage went? It, it's an expression of a complete loss of intimacy. And life can't flow out of it. When I thought about this story, I thought, you know, I think Uzzah and McCall would have made a great couple. No, really. Just think about it. Someone who thinks it's their responsibility to manage God and someone who thinks it's their responsibility to manage the impressions of other people, they would have made a great couple walking beside the ark of God, but all of their existence would have been completely lifeless because it's not what God calls us to do. We're not here to manage him or other people's impressions of us. We're here to focus on him and rejoice in the blessings he's brought into our lives. And that is how you get your dance back. Let's bow our heads this morning. So maybe you've uh, sensed a little bit of increasing judgmentalism in your own heart, and uh, maybe you're more worried about the reputation of Christianity or of church than you are about people connecting to God and who gets access to him. I would just encourage you, go back and be reintroduced to your first love of the grace of God all over again. And maybe for some of us, the things that have made us afraid or frustrated have taken our eyes off of the things that, that are the blessings of God in our life. Our life is saturated with them, and yet we can be completely blind to them because all we can see is the thing that annoys us or scares us. And so I would just really encourage you, take note of the blessings of God in your life and maybe even start writing down in a notebook, even if it's just one thing a day, and acknowledge the goodness of God. And what you'll begin to notice is that you start moving out of this paralyzed existence where you are afraid and you are frustrated to the kind of joy and God consciousness that allows you to dance and celebrate again. So Father, I ask that you would help us with this. Um, there's so many things that are not the way we would want. And it's so easy to focus so much of our life on that. Would you help us see your blessings in our life and rejoice in them? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.